There's even an algebraic description of the tangent space of a manifold at a point for those people who don't have geometric intuition or perhaps who just like a more algebraic description of the phenomena. But before we talk about manifolds, we have to revisit the notion of a differential operator for functions on Euclidean space, because there were some things that we forgot to mention when we spoke about them the first time. But for this, we're going to need a little bit of a perhaps abstract definition, uh, so bear with me. Um, most of you know many examples, and we'll list a bunch of examples in a moment. So an associative algebra, or sometimes I'll just call it algebra for short, if I don't want to be um, too you know, lengthy. An associative algebra is a vector space, and all of our vector spaces over are real numbers for now, so it's some vector space, and I'm going to call it A for algebra, together with a binary operation that takes two elements in your algebra, and it gives you another element in your algebra. And we think of this binary operation as the product of two elements. And in fact, we even write A comma B gets sent to A times B. Satisfying the following conditions. First, this product is associative. That's why the word associative is here. A, B, C equals A, B, C. Second, it's distributive over addition. on the right, and it's also distributive in addition on the left. And this is for all A, B, C um, in A. And in fact, just to be a little safe, um, we may also need um, I should have thought about this a little bit more deeply, but I think we also need that um, if I multiply a constant multiple of A, then this is going to be lambda AB. And also, this also equals A lambda B. I believe I also need something, something like this for all real numbers, lambda and A, B, and A. So this is what an associative algebra is. Um, it's more important to just think conceptually. It's something where we can multiply things, and it satisfies a lot of the usual assumptions we might make. However, it doesn't necessarily have to satisfy commutativity. So A is commutative if and only if AB equals BA for all A and B. Conveniently, I've written this right here as well. So it's commutative if, this, if um, I can always multiply in any order in which I choose. So immediately some examples. The set of real numbers under the usual addition and multiplication of real numbers is an associative algebra. In fact, it's a commutative associative algebra. Second is the set of m by m matrices and the product of matrices is the matrix product of matrices and you can check that it satisfies all of these conditions um, a sub example of m by m matrices is for instance upper triangular m by m matrices and the reason is because if you take an upper triangular matrix and you multiply it by another upper triangular matrix, you still get an upper triangular matrix. And again, if you add upper triangular matrices, you still get an upper triangular matrix. It's very important that both of those conditions are satisfied. Diagonal M by M matrices as well work.
Here the multiplication is rather simple, and in fact, diagonal matrices form a commutative subalgebra. As yet another example, if I take the set of continuous functions from R to R, remember the way R notation reads is we read from right to left. So the set of continuous functions from R to R is an algebra. First of all, it's a vector space because we can add functions. So let's just write this f plus g at the point x is just f of x plus g of x. By definition, um, lambda f at x is defined to be lambda times f of x. And the multiplication, the product of two functions, is defined to be the function whose value is f of x times g of x. And the same is true for any subset of R. I don't have to put R here. I could have put any subset A of R. Or I could have also replaced this by actually anything at all. Any set x can go here. And I wouldn't write any more continuous functions from a set x to R because that doesn't even make sense. But I could replace this entire mathematical object with just the set of functions from x to r. And we wrote that as r to the exponent x um, for good reason. I'll let you think about why in case you're not sure why we wrote that. And so following along from this example, we make a definition that's specific to one of these instances, and that's when we take not just continuous functions, but smooth functions. So we make the uh, definition a derivation of Rn at the point C in Rn. Let me just write that to be clear. Is a linear function which we denote by curly V with a subscript C from the set of all smooth functions whose domain is Rn, and it goes to R, and it gives me a number. So it's a linear function that takes any smooth function, and it gives me a number. And I'm going to think of this. We'll see in a minute. We're going to think of this as somehow taking the derivative in some prescribed way of a function and evaluating it at C. That's kind of what it's like. Satisfying, and the reason that's kind of what it's like, is because it satisfies the following very crucial and important condition, which says, if I take any two functions and I multiply them, then this equals, I act on the first function and I get, I get a number, that's what this says, multiplied by the value of g at c, which is another number, plus f of c, which is a number, times applying this linear function to g, which is also another number. So it satisfies this, and this is called the Leibniz property. I hope I spelled this correctly. <laughs> property or rule, familiar from ordinary derivatives. And this definition might seem a little abstract. Where does it come from? But if you compare this to something we've already done before, we talked about vector fields in a way that's very similar to this. But what we said was that vector fields act on differentiable functions and give us differentiable functions again. This is very, very similar. In fact, this is a special case of that. What we do is we have a function that's differentiable, apply a vector field, and then evaluate that function at the point C. And that's going to give us some number if our, if our codomain of that initial function was indeed R. So what's an example of such a derivation? Well, it's closely related to the, what I just mentioned. Let V be a vector, VC be a vector in the tangent space let's just make it simple, of Rn itself. 
and let f be a differentiable function from rn to r. Then we can define a differential operator that takes an arbitrary function such as the one here and it's defined to be applying the differential of the function f at c and evaluating it at the vector vc. And this is, so here I should have actually written this down here for all such f. This is an example of a derivation at c and we actually gave a reason for this last time. This follows from uh, the chain rule and the product rule. And so now you might wonder, okay, this gives us an example of a derivation of Rn at C. Are there any other examples? Namely, do all examples come from such vectors? If you give me a vector, I can give you a derivation. But if I give you a derivation, can you give me a vector that comes from it in this particular formula? And the surprising result, the really surprising result, is that that's true. Every such derivation does come from such a vector, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two descriptions. And what we'll do next time is we'll prove this theorem for derivations in Euclidean space.